Hi guys, this is Jake Allspot again, and this is going to be another brief video intended to support you guys as you write your way through English 110. This is going to be uh, how to write through a critical lens. And this is going to be an important one because, as I'm sure you know, SA2 of E110 asks you to analyze a film scene which relates to your course's focus. To do so, you're asked to engage with one of the written texts you've been reading and, quote, craft a lens that helps you make an insightful claim about the scene's representation of this issue. Then, draw a conclusion about how the understanding of the scene changes once the lens is applied. In the essay with a so what about how the scene represents important information to the audience's understanding of the film. All right, and I bet a lot of students read that and go, say what? And that's what this presentation is going to be about. We're going to try to figure out what the heck that's talking about and how we're going to accomplish it. So what is a lens and why do we use one? Using a critical lens to analyze another source is really the act of reading and making meaning out of the target source by applying the ideas of a lens source to the target source that you are viewing or reading. Okay. So we think of the lens as sort of a metaphor. If you look through like a spyglass, what you look for, uh, what you were previously looking at, now you're looking through a lens is magnified or changed or um, modified, right? It reveals something different about it. So that's sort of when we say lens, that's, what, that's the metaphor, sort of a, an eyeglass. We use critical lenses for a few reasons. Um, when you're writing analytically about a piece, especially a film scene, as you guys are going to do, um, there's a lot going on. There's audio, there's video, there's the content, the subject matter, imagery, colors. So it can be really daunting. There's so much going on that it's unclear like where you should start or what stance you should take. But applying a critical lens narrows the scope of what we're looking at and it allows us to be more selective about what we're viewing and writing about. Okay, So it just sort of makes the project more manageable. But I think the biggest reason, the most important reason that we use a lens is that it can highlight surprising or important things from the text or the video, whatever our target source is, that we would not have seen had we not used the lens. Using a critical lens can highlight new, different, interesting things that wouldn't have occurred to us had we not used the lens to look at the target. So you guys don't need to memorize all this, but just for some general knowledge, these are some very um, examples of well-known critical lenses that higher level students are going to make use um, on bigger projects. If you go to graduate school, certainly you'd be using things like this, but people will write through a Marxist lens, right, out of the idea of, of Karl Marx, and that is viewing art and literature as reflections of the social institutions and the history and the class dynamics from which they originate. They are expressions of the social structure of the time, right? You might look through a psychoanalytic lens that's coming out of Freudian psychology, and the school of thought analyzes characters based on sort of their psychological motives and development throughout uh, the text. People write through a feminist um, lens where they're seeking to apply ideas based on feminist pr uh, theory using principles, ideology, politics of feminism, to understand um, art and text, right? So how are we going to do this, right? So we don't know exactly what sort of what your lens will be. That's sort of up to you. But whatever your lens is and your target text is, this is how to kind of get started. So you want to read your lens text first if you haven't already done so. Theoretical or critical lens text can be pretty dense and complex. It depends on what you're working with, but you want to develop a general understanding of the author's primary points and ideas. That's super important because you need to understand them when you go and look at your target text because you need to know what to be looking for. So you need to understand your, um, your lens text relatively well to go and then attack your primary text, your target text, right? So once you feel like you have a general working knowledge of the lens text, you want to read the target text and develop um, a series of questions. You want to start asking yourself, where do I see general points of contact between the lens and the target? Which of the lens's main arguments could I apply to the target text? It's sort of a similar idea. So where, where are they connecting? What seems applicable? 
can I apply the text of the or the vocabulary and the logic of the lens text to instances I see in the target text? Are there places where the ideas of the lens text are not going to apply, and why is that? How I'm going how am I going to explain that? All right. So th these are the sort of general questions you need to be asking yourself as you try to start to connect these two pieces. So when you're actually starting to write, as your paper is really concerned about the relationship and these interactions between two texts, your lens and your target, it's important to explain very clearly what you're going to be doing. right? So maybe your reader has not read your lens text. Maybe they haven't seen your target text, your film. So you want to be clear about sort of surmising what are the main ideas of the, the lens text, what are the specific arguments they make, and how are you going to be employing them to make sense of your target text. You want to be pretty explicit about that in your introduction. And these introductions of these texts should lead to some kind of thesis statement. And it's, it's not, you know, it will depend a lot on sort of what kind of claims you're making, what your thesis will be, but you should get to some kind of so what. And a lot of times a successful so what with these kind of writing assignments can be it matters because the lens text changes our understanding of the target text. It matters because this is not apparent until you apply the lens to the target, right? And because perhaps other people haven't done so, maybe they've been misreading the target all these years. Maybe you're adding something really new here. So perhaps your so what is this changes our understanding. That can be successful. So I want to give you guys one real example of doing this. And I thought, let's look at some popular culture magazines. So Men's Health and Women's Health. Um, we can just look for a second. These are going to be our target texts. We're going to use a critical lens to make sense of them. But it's sort of, it'd be hard without a lens, right? Like, what's going on here? What would you say about it? What would you write about it? There's two people, attractive, I suppose. There's colors, there's text, like there's a lot going on. Like what would you, how would you start? Well, a lens is going to tell us how we might start. This is one of my favorite books. It's from John Berger. Uh, he wrote in the, in the 1970s. This is called Ways of Seeing. And Berger was a, um, uh, a writer, a critic. He was really interested in popular culture. And he was really interested in sort of the portrayals of women in popular culture, and especially advertisements. So forgive me for reading at you for just a moment, but this is from chapter 3 of Ways of Seeing. A man's presence is dependent on the promise of power which he embodies. If the promise is large and credible, his presence is striking. The promised power may be moral, physical, temperamental, economic, social, sexual, but its object is always exterior to the man. A man's presence suggests what he is capable of doing to you or for you. By contrast, a woman's presence expresses her own attitude to, your, to herself and defines what can and cannot be done to her. A woman must continually watch herself. She must survey everything she is and everything she does because how she appears to others, especially how she appears to men, determines how she will be treated. Men survey women before treating them. One might simply simplify this by saying, men act and women appear. Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. This determines not only most relations between men and women, but also the relation of women, women to themselves. She turns herself into an object, and most particularly, an object of vision, a sight." End quote. So, a lot going on here. But we need to start to try break it down to some working knowledge, because we're going to try to apply this. So, what John Berger, he's saying a lot, but roughly, I think what he's saying is that he saw that men and women, their presence, their sort of embodiment was different in the culture that he saw of the 70s. And the difference is many-fold, but for the man, his presence is external to himself. It is a verb, it's action. He has power if he is capable of doing to you, violently, sexually, whatever, or for you, providing economically, providing protection, perhaps. But a woman's is different. Her presence ex is internal. It expresses her attitude toward herself. She knows that the way she displays herself to the world defines what she will tolerate done to her. So as a result, the woman must continually watch herself. As, as Berger says, she surveys herself because she needs to be constantly aware of how she appears because that determines how she will be treated. Right? 
that's roughly kind of what he's talking about here. Men act, women appear. All right, so with that in mind, we could start to break this down and come up with some really interesting observations, right? We might start to look at the imagery, their bodies, what's displayed, how are they displayed? They both are showing skin, it's in very different ways. The man is ready to, to knock you out, right? Um, he's very muscular. The woman is displaying very intentionally sort of her legs, abdomen, um, and chest and neck, sort of, I would argue, passively, right? The dress, the man's got boxing gloves on. He's got jeans on. He's ready to act. The woman has a sort of breezy, form-fitting shirt, again, open at the neck and belly. How about their stance? Like, how are they displaying their bodies. The man is leaned forward. He's got a big, you can't see his feet, but from his hips you can see he's got a big, wide, balanced stance. He's ready to strike, right? The woman, um, her hands are hidden behind her head um, and back. I would suggest that, or I would argue that suggests passivity, right? Um, she's leaned back away from the camera. Her legs are crossed. Um, it seems like if you were to, to reach out for her or chase her, she might just fall over, right? How about the text around them? So on the man's side, men's health, uh, above his left shoulder, sex of her dreams, right? Berger, do to you or for you. Versus the woman by um, her right shoulder on our left, look great naked, right? So men act, women appear. How about some of the other texts? Superhero abs, does that... Is that more acting or appearing? I would say that's more acting versus the flat belly foods by the woman, much more passive. The colors, we might notice that men's health is in sort of a dark red. Might we suggest, you know, point out that that's the color of blood. And the woman's is a light blue, sort of a pastel. Like even their gaze and their expression. So the man is looking over, if we imagine ourselves as the, the viewer, um, in front of these figures. The man is looking over our left shoulder, right, past us. He's got this sort of deadpan, like, poker face. The woman is actually meeting eye contact with the viewer. She's looking into your eyes, and she's smiling. And what that these, this says to me is that the man doesn't care about you as the viewer. He's looking past you. He looks like he's ready to, like, punch someone behind you. The woman making eye contact and smiling suggests to me that she's almost asking for the viewer's approval, right? She has herself on display and she's sort of like, what do you think? Men act, women appear. So these are the sort of things that we, we might start to notice, right? It narrows down our observations as we start to look through this lens. Um, and we might start to do some writing. So we might brainstorm and we might say that, you know, when we apply these ideas from ways of seeing our critical lens to our target lens, these, these magazines, we see that they are a reflection of a culture in which men and women are learning different lessons about their value, about their importance, and what about them imbues them with value and importance. Um, and that the man's is external, the woman's is internal. After all, you know, these are two images intended to be a demonstration of health and beauty. They're sort of idealized female forms. That's why they're on magazines, right? And men's health seems to affirm that health means embodying the idea, the ability to do for you or to you, as Berger writes, with the big muscles, the confident stance, the boxing gloves, looking past you, not caring. You know, with the, from the, the text, suggesting what he can do violently or sexually. Women's health, by contrast, affirms that a woman, as Berger puts it, must survey herself, and she displays herself visually the way she appears it messages to people around her what she will tolerate done to her. In this specific ad, health seems to suggest that she is sexually desirable and available, right? And so we might eventually arrive at a so what that criticizes men and women's health magazines, you know, as reinforcing some pretty problematic messaging to both men and women who are, you know, quote unquote, trying to be healthy. And again, this is where we started. What do you do with that? But as you start to work through a lens, you start to notice all of these other things pop out and take on new meaning. That's what we talk about when looking through the lens changes what we were originally looking at. It brings meaning to the surface. I hope that was a helpful. Remember that as you work through this, guys, you can make appointments with writing tutors through Starfish. 
to get help on essay 2 of English 110 or any other writing assignment that you're doing for the university. Good luck using a critical lens uh, to apply to your films and we hope to see you in the Center for Academic Achievement.